Today's topic, I want to discuss where to put my money after retirement. So this is meant for the individual that's either nearing retirement or they're currently hitting their retirement stage. And they just want to understand what sort of strategy that they should be taking that's going to apply to their specific situation. Each individual goals are going to be different. So the purpose of this video is to go over four main areas that every individual should cover to make sure that they have efficient and effective plan. So what I mean by that is there's four crucial areas. You have one, one area is known as distribution planning. The other area is known as investment or growth planning. The third area is known as estate or legacy planning. And then the fourth area is known as tax planning. So each one of these areas is going to have their own significance uh, towards what an individual's goals are. So some, per, some individual or couple may be uh, you know, more infatuated with, I want to make sure you know, whatever we don't use up, we're leaving to our kids, we're leaving to our grandkids, we're leaving some sort of legacy. Versus another individual who just says, hey, I, you know, I've, worked, I've worked all these years, I have all these different buckets, all these different assets that are ultimately sitting here, and I want to make sure that I'm draining this well dry until that date of death. Try to be as accurate as possible, take as much cash flow as possible, so I just have all this boatload of money coming to me that I could go and, and you know utilize whatever discretionary needs I, I have, whatever you know my goal is for that year. If that's I want to join a country club, I want to be golfing every you know every week, I want to uh, go on different vacations, uh, you know for the first few years throughout retirement. All those different things are going to be you know important for that individual situation. So when we're looking at the four most crucial areas, distribution planning, there's a couple different ways on how to really leverage or break down the distribution planning need. Uh, what I mean by that is understanding what your expenses are currently, and then also what they're going to be throughout retirement. So I speak about this in some of the other videos, and I say typically when somebody nears retirement or they're hitting that first retirement stage, they go into these three different areas of income or income needs. The first area is going to be their go-go stage. So this is where you know they just recently retired. They no longer have to go to work. They no longer have to rely on going to work. So they're on the go. They're saying, you know what, this is this is what I've dreamed about. This is where I want to have some fun. I want to be active. I want to go on vacation, me and my spouse. All this time, I want to be on the go, go, go. This could last anywhere between five years, could last to 15 years, to 10 years, could only go from two to three years. It really just depends on that individual situation and really what their mindset is. After that, so let's say if we have a, a given scenario where somebody retires at age 65, as an example, maybe from 65 to 70 or 65 to 75, they're going to always be on the go. So that might require that they have higher expenses within those first five to 10 years. Then they start going into the slow go years. You know what? We've experienced a lot of great things throughout retirement. Uh, I just want to slow down a little bit. You know, my body's aching. I, you know, I understand all these different joys, but at the end of the day, I just want to kind of calm down a little bit. So that's where they're going to be slowing down. So maybe that's going to last for another, you know, five to 10 years. And then you have kind of the depressing stage, which is known as the no-go years. And I'm hoping that everybody watching this video at least has some sort of plan from a personal standpoint. That they don't really get into that no-go stage, but it is a reality of life. If, whenever you, you know, when, if you don't die, you live. When you live, you become frail. So that's where the no-go years come into play of saying, you know, the highlight of your week might be bringing in the garbage cans. It's going to be visiting different doctors, going to different doctor's appointments. Just trying to maintain somewhat of your health to make sure that, you know, it's it's you're not getting injured, that you're not you know falling victim to some sort of ailments, different things that you could be susceptible towards those later years. So by having some sort of strategy towards your go-go years, your slow-go years, and your no-go years, it can be very effective. And at the end of the day, all it is is just math. So when we're looking at the expenses, you might be saying if somebody's, let's say, age 62, and they want to retire at age 65, their expenses at age two, at age 62 could be X amount of dollars. Their, their expenses at age 65 could be slightly higher than that, could be slightly lower than that. Really just depends on what they want to see as their ideal retirement stage, as, as their ideal retirement situation. So this is where we try to help out with budgeting analysis. And we try to uh, micromanage every little aspect off of getting an individual to think, okay, you know, is this going to be an expense? When you're trying to break things down on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, how much are you going to be spending for groceries? How often do you want to go out to eat? All those different mathematical components are going to be important because when we're understanding exactly what these expenses are, now we know what that goal is, what we have to hit from your distribution planning side. And that's where we bring in the other layer. So if we know that the, the an individual's expenses are X amount of dollars throughout their retirement, 
Maybe there might be certain drop-offs in expenses, but we want to incorporate for that, or there might be increases in those expenses due to inflationary needs. So we want to make sure they incorporate that within a specific plan. When we're looking underneath the hood, what are the most common types of distribu or of, of income sources or cash flow sources that are going to an individual throughout retirement? And that's what breaks down to Social Security income and pension income. Typically, all individuals are offered some sort of Social Security benefit, but majority of individuals are not offered a pension benefit. So this is where we have to see what are the individual's expenses, what are we trying to plan out for, what are their Social Security income streams going to be at their ideal retirement date when they're turning on that spigot, and then is there a specific gap or is there an additional income source such as pension, such as you know some sort of inheritance that they know is going to be lasting them for the next 10, 20, 30 years, what sort of assets are going to be available from a cash flow perspective? If let's say their expenses are greater than or equal to what their guaranteed income sources are, what their cash flows are, well, then there's going to be a gap there. This is where an individual should be relying on a proper distribution plan and proper distribution and withdrawal strategies to make sure to close up this gap and to ultimately create some sort of safety net to say, Every year that I'm living, every month that I'm living, I'm getting in this, this sort of paycheck for my life and for me and my spouse's life, that's the most important, or if that individual is married, for the rest of their life so that they cannot outlive these cash flows. And that's where a proper plan comes in. And this is why the distribution planning is so crucial. And let's say we're, we're going to the op opposite side of the coin. If somebody, let's say, has expenses of 60000 and we really pinpointed all these expenses, and that's really the most that this individual is going to have, throughout their entire retirement and will incorporate different inflationary needs, inflationary expenses. So this might increase, you know, uh, year by year, month by month. But the individual Social Security income is, let's say, 35000 And then they're also receiving a pension income stream of 100000 And this is joint life pension. This is $135,000 of cash flow. Maybe the pension has some sort of cost of living adjustment on it. You have Social Security at that time, at, obviously currently has a cost of living adjustment, which that could go away in the future. But the combination of this 135000 versus the expenses in this example of $60,000, you are more than ahead of the game where you don't have to leverage your outside assets to close up any gap because there is no gap. You're so far into the green that now you could look at other strategies to say, okay, let me look at my all this excess monies that I'm not using up, let me look at it towards an investment growth play, towards an estate legacy play, towards maybe I want to leverage different Roth conversions and have all my monies uh, not susceptible to required minimum distributions when I hit age 72, 73. It used to be 70 and a half, and then that, that has ultimately changed. So that's where by understanding and really delving into and, and looking at the distribution planning side as the most important area, it makes everything else fall into place. Now, there's different obviously mathematical moves to be more efficient, more effective off of these other areas. But from a distribution planning side, we really want to make sure that everything is, is keyed in there to understand what the individual's expenses are, what their cash flow is, and then is there a gap there? If there's a gap there, how do we close up that gap through their remaining assets? 401k accounts, 403b accounts, IRA accounts, Roth IRA accounts, non-qualified accounts, there's a slew of different ways on how somebody could ultimately look at these in the form of buckets. And let me actually clear off the screen. So ultimately look at these different assets. If let's say you had like a non-qualified checking savings account or you had a 401k account or, you know, you had an IRA account or you had a Roth IRA account. You know, these are ultimately all these different buckets that an individual could leverage. So if there's a gap there and many times there is a gap, an individual, when they start, you know, planning on retirement and they're let's say in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, whatever that case is, they're on a wealth accumulation mindset. So they're trying to grow their monies. They're trying to save, 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 grow their monies, make sure that they're leveraging the stock market or they're leveraging some sort of rate of return that's going to keep pace with inflation and ultimately try to get these buckets nice and fat, as fat as possible, so that when it comes time where someone's going to hit their retirement stage, really their point B, how can they draw down those buckets or leverage these buckets most effectively, most efficiently? And this is where by utilizing and understanding really what your expenses are, what your cash flows are, and then what that gap is, how to make sure that you're closing that gap. Closing that gap might be relying upon different laddering strategies. So let's say somebody wants to retire at 55 and they have to ladder proper you know, distribution strategies from 55 to 60. Then at age 60, they could trigger different spigots from their IRA accounts or their Roth IRA accounts. That's going to be a specific strategy as opposed to somebody that's 62 
has a few more years of accumulation left, they want to retire at age 65, that could be a whole nother slew of planning. So this is where really distribution planning is, you know, is, is at the, at the forefront. This is the most imperative, most important thing possible is making sure that you're getting your distribution planning right. And if you don't have a distribution plan, if you're unsure of how to do this correctly, that's where we try to help individuals. We help individuals on a daily basis all throughout the country. And simply, you would just call the 1-800 number. You would reference this video, ask to speak to a specialist uh, regarding your situation. And then we'll make sure that we'll have the correct advisor uh, you know, reach out to you and we do Zoom calls, uh, phone calls, really whatever your comfort level is to help you get on that correct trajectory. A large part of distribution planning is also understanding your asset, such as Social Security income. A lot of individuals just think, okay, it's just kind of sitting there. Well, if you're getting, let's say, $40,000 per year of Social Security income, we're not even incorporating the cost of living adjustment because that's going to increase it further and further and further. But $40,000 for 10 years is 400000 For 20 years, it's 800000 For 30 years, it's $1.2 million. That is an asset, and that is a continuous cash flow. So there's certain Social Security optimization strategies as part of the distribution planning process to make sure that if you have a spouse, there's certain uh, file and suspense strategies, there's certain uh, spousal benefits or um, uh, you know benefits that an individual could leverage between their Social Security income and their spouse's Social Security income to make sure that they're able to capture those dollars the in, in the most uh, maximized and efficient way. So that could be por portions of distribution planning side. Also, does it make more sense to take monies from taxable accounts, to take monies from, you know, non-qualified or from, you know, pre-tax or tax deferred related accounts, taxable accounts, uh, you know, Roth accounts or tax free related accounts? How does that affect the Social Security income later on? And that's where you have something called provisional income with Social Security. So if you're taking too many dollars too quickly and that those dollars are going to be taxable dollars and that's going to affect the provisional income calculation on Social Security, you could net a lot less Social Security income because those dollars have to go towards taxation. So it's, it's all these little micro shifts is why it is important to at least understand your distribution planning side. Now, that step two aspect is investment or growth planning. And these are really the fun dollars. This is really where an individual could have fun with whatever they don't need for their distribution planning or their income planning needs. That's where they could leverage towards their growth planning towards whether they're leveraging investments, whether they're leveraging fixed accounts, fixed indexed accounts. There's a whole multitude of different things. And that really comes down to that individual's risk tolerance. So case in point, whenever we help out individuals and they're trying to grow their dollars and they grow their ancillary dollars because, you know, we obviously created the proper distribution planning uh, strategy and we make sure that all of that is covered. We at least give them their specific safety net that they're trying to accomplish what their expenses are. And we're also making sure that they're leaving dollars aside for some sort of emergency needs, some sort of six to 12 months in case of an oh my gosh moment was to occur. Now you have all these little ancillary dollars left over. And this is this is a really fantastic play because the more dollars that are set up towards that investment growth strategy means that they could have fun with it and they could really be flexible off of what their risk tolerance is to make sure that's set up an efficient plan. If let's say we're creating different growth related uh, strategies or growth planning strategies where someone's trying to accumulate their dollars because they're not quite at retirement yet, or they just reach retirement and now they're trying to grow these dollars for some sort of purpose, we want to understand what is their purpose. So what really makes them tick? What is the purpose of these dollars? Is it just to have like some sort of short term play? Because that sort of strategy is going to be a lot different than Hey, I just want this money to grow. I'm not really going to be touching it because I already have my distribution strategy covered. So I just want it to, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, be invested in the market and hope that it's going to ebb and flow and be be positive year by year by year. And what we try to do is help an individual understand something called the reef method. We coined the term the reef method. It goes by risk tolerance. So based on what somebody's risk tolerance is, and we use artificial intelligence software to help us understand what somebody's subconscious. Uh, you know, risk tolerance is whether they're risk tolerant, whether they're risk averse. If somebody says, oh, I love the market, love the market, love the market, and all of a sudden we put them through our software and we understand that they're super risk averse, that's not going to work. Recommendations off of investments and, you know, utilizing the market where it can ebb and flow and have these these dips and these, these you know, peaks and these valleys and all of that, that might not be the, the correct situation versus the opposite side when someone feels like they might be conservative, more risk averse, and all of a sudden their risk score is coming back you know, extremely high. And we're saying, you know what, you might actually subconsciously, you're telling us that you would be willing to take on more risk. So maybe we take slivers of the, the you know, assets and, and making sure that that's, you know, set up on that riskier trajectory. 
Uh, the next aspect is, you know, looking at their, uh, examining what their current situation is and really seeing if their risk tolerance is in line with their current situation. If, you know, it's coming back that they're super risk averse, but yet they're sitting in everything related to the stock market and equities and different things that have different sorts of risk, well, that might be a problem. That's not going to be in line with, you know, what they truly want to see with their accounts if, you know, they're, they're really scared that the market's going to be going down. But yet they're super, you know, they're super aggressive or vice versa. So this is where we would examine what their situation is. And some people absolutely love specific stocks. So let's say they're they're managing their own IRA or they have a brokerage account and they love some, you know, Amazon stock or Tesla or whatever that is. And they always want to hold on to it. Well, then, you know, most likely they're doing something correctly. And we don't want to typically whenever we give recommendations, we want to recommend specific tweaks. So not something that just taking somebody's plan, ripping it apart and then just giving it back to them, something that they're not going to understand. We want them to see what their wins are and then what are some slight tweaks to make to make sure that, you know, they, they can at least be set up on the correct mathematical trajectory to really grow these accounts and really, you know, line it up with whatever their goal is. The next thing is eggs. You know, what are their eggs and what are the remaining eggs in their basket? If they have IRA accounts, well, then you might have thousands of different combinations of different customization that they could do. If, let's say somebody just has a loan 401k account and that 401k account only has anywhere between 15 to 20 different options. Well, how much juice could we squeeze out of that? You know, it's going to be more limited than what you could do there in an IRA. But if an individual cannot move their 401k and that's what they're susceptible to, well, how can we help them choose the correct allocation based on what their risk tolerance is, what their current situation is. You know, if they're just sitting in a target date fund, does that make sense? If let's say they're super risk averse, uh, you know, they want to go into something that's just going to give them some sort of safe rate of return, like a stable value fund. All these different ideas, you know, has to line up to what their risk tolerance is. And that's what's really, you know, uh, manning the ship. That's what's really, you know, the, the engine that that's basically pushing everything along to make sure that it's getting that person towards their ideal, uh, you know, th their ideal goal. And then the, the last one, the F is for fees. So if there's different ways to restrict fees, that would restrict the drag that somebody has on their account. Case in point, if someone's just using a bunch of mutual funds, and let's say the mutual funds are super expensive, over 1%, but yet they could go and leverage different index-related strategies, different things they either have no fees or very limited fees, that could, that could obviously put them in a better situation uh, then something that has that large drag that hasn't really given them some sort of, you know, favorable rate of return. It's been more of a detriment than actually helping them out. So by alleviating that pressure, and if, let's say you're able to reduce your fee by 1% and you're doing that for 10, 20, 30 years, that's a huge difference. That's a huge compound interest difference uh, off of somebody's account balance going forward. So from the pure investment standpoint, an individual could go and, and uh, you know, really leverage different concepts of like a modern portfolio theory, making sure that they're spread amongst different asset classes. Or they could just say, hey, I want to leverage this portion for just pure risk. This portion, I want to see what's the best fixed account. I want to use an insurance company as like a fixed annuity or a bank product, like a bank CD. You know, what would be the best option there? Or they could go into more of like those fixed index related accounts, which grow whenever the market goes up, doesn't lose when it goes down. But if somebody has money sitting aside, and they're, we're talking about their investment, their growth planning strategy. And let's say they have 300,000. They don't have to go 300,000 towards one specific strategy. You can say, okay, let me splice up a hundred grand into a, you know, a very safe aspect, a hundred grand into a, you know, fixed index aspect, another hundred thousand into uh, some sort of, you know, super aggressive aspect. Because if this super aggressive goes down, well, it didn't really hurt them that much because they, at least they padded up these other areas versus if the super aggressive, uh, you know, uh, strategy is doing really well. And these guys are just kind of chugging along. Well, at least they're able to take advantage of those opportunities. So it's all about just making sure it's like individual pieces in a puzzle. And you want each puzzle to fit correctly to be most efficient, most effective. Uh, when you're looking at your investment growth planning side, just like you're looking at the most efficient, effective route for your distribution planning side. The third crucial area is estate legacy planning needs. So estate planning could be as simple as just making sure you have a will, have a trust in play, or legacy planning where you're saying, okay, I have these, these leftover dollars. I have these accounts that I know I'm never going to dip into from a distribution planning side. Uh, I might want to trickle off some monies from this from a, uh, you know, as an ancillary planning side of just saying, anytime that my investments do well, I'm going to go and use an extra vacation. But now you have all these extra accounts that are just set up for as a legacy play. Well, does it make sense to leave an IRA that's a pre-tax 
ret uh, retirement account, pre-tax, tax-deferred retirement account that's going to be fully taxable to your beneficiaries? Or does it make sense to take that IRA and make sure that you could, uh, you could have that grow on an exponential basis and also have it go to beneficiaries tax-free? That could be a proper form of legacy play. The individuals could leverage life insurance to, to go and, uh, you know, arbitrage their opportunities to make sure that they're turning their qualified accounts into the most, uh, you know, effective routes or just even their non-qualified, their cash accounts, their taxable accounts. How to make sure that they're leveraging their chips the right way if they know unequivocally, I'm never going to touch these monies and this is set aside to leave as the proper legacy play for my loved ones. So that's where legacy planning, and there's a whole multitude of different things on how someone can utilize it, but it has to make mathematical sense. You're not going to want to leverage a strategy if it's going to cost you money. The only reason to leverage a specific strategy is so that it's going to compound that effect, it's going to compound that benefit, and that would be beneficial to somebody later on as per you know what you want to see, as per what your wishes are. So I hope that this makes sense. Um, and tax planning could really you know cover all these different aspects. If you have proper tax planning and let's say you're leveraging conversion strategies or utilizing 7702 tax strategies as you're working or as you're nearing retirement or you're utilizing these different assets to take your accounts, grow them on a tax-free basis, pull your monies out tax-free. If you just go through a simple example, if someone's pulling out $80,000 per year and that's tax-free money versus someone pulling out $100,000 per year, they're in a 30% tax bracket, they're only going to be able to net $70,000 because $30,000 is going towards those taxes, which obviously makes sense. But then there's also a, another layer to that because if you're taking money from $100,000 of a taxable account, that's going to increase the amount of taxation or the amount of provisional income calculation. And that would affect how much of your social security income is going to be taxed. If you have monies coming out of a tax-free account, and you're doing that out, you're, you're working those numbers out properly well, then you'll have a lot higher of a net of Social Security income, so you don't have to rely on your other assets to go and make up whatever that, to cover whatever that gap is between your expenses and your income. So everything all lines into one another. So if you notice the distribution planning, investment planning, estate planning, and tax planning, that spells out diet. And that's why I trademarked the process known as the retirement diet plan, because there's four crucial areas to any sort of financial plan. And it's not just about having these different buckets and setting it and forgetting it and hoping that everything works out. It's actually having a plan in place. And that's what we try to help out individuals is understand what their current situation is. What is their point A? What is their point B? Meaning what is their ideal retirement date or really what is most important to them? If they're you know, on their deathbed, as morbid as it might sound. But if an individual is on their deathbed and they're looking back and they're saying, okay, in retirement, I want to do X, Y, Z. I'm really pissed off that I didn't get to do this, that I didn't, I wasn't motivated enough throughout retirement, that I was too safe. When you're looking at it from that perspective, what do you see as your ideal retirement day? When you no longer have to work, when you know that everything is being covered properly, between your expenses, you don't have to stress about that because there's an actual plan in place between what your expenses are and what your cash flow is. What do you ideally want to see? And then how to make sure that that picture could be painted properly, how to take that stress away from the financial aspect. And that's what we try to help out individuals do. Um, you know, and it's just, it's, it's from pretty much every individual is going to have a different answer, but you don't want to leave anything to chance. And you want to make sure that it's at least you're, you know, you're living the life that you've always dreamt of when you do hit those stages. The math behind it, that's what we try to help out. And that's where we try to go and say, okay, you want to be smart in this area. You want to be smart in this area, et cetera, et cetera. So that's actually creating a plan. And there's a lot of problems with individuals that they try to do this on their own. Or they might be leveraging an advisor that, let's say, is only good at, you know, growing their accounts or an advisor that's only good at, uh, you know, placing their money into a fixed account and they're leveraging only insurance products. So that's where you want to avoid the most common mistakes because it can hurt you by placing dollars into the wrong direction that might require further years of work less years of actually hitting that retirement stage or having to live off of less money so that you're not able to do those things that you've always dreamt of. That's where from a distribution planning side, from an investment growth planning side, if let's say you threw too many layers or too much money into that side without at least accomplishing your distribution planning needs, that could be a complete disaster because if the market's crashing and you're super aggressive, well, then you would have to go back to work when you're in your 70s and your 80s because you or have a significant lifestyle change because you didn't create this strategy properly. Estate legacy planning, does it make sense to just leave your money in an account and just say, oh, well, it's going to be left over to my beneficiaries? Or do you actually want that to be maximized 
going to your beneficiary. So that now that could build some sort of lifestyle for them. And you understand that, once again, in that morbid death benefit scenario, uh, uh, you know, uh, deathbed scenario, where you're saying, I wanted to you know, make sure that I'm leaving this. I'm leaving some sort of legacy to my loved ones so they could always remember me. If that's something important to you, well, then you want to make sure that you're creating the proper strategy on it. And then tax planning, everything with tax planning really encompasses and it really helps out all those those three areas above it. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're not efficient with it, that's obviously a problem. And once again, our solution is helping an individual through all the all four of these main areas. And it's all about getting into a conversation about what's most important to that person. Every little nook and cranny of what makes an individual tick. Why do they think a certain way? What is what do they see as their ideal lifestyle today versus when they hit retirement? Versus when they start nearing that, you know, slow go or no go stage that I mentioned in the beginning of this video. And, you know, there's, there's ways on how to be effective, be efficient. And that's where we try to help out individuals. And we do this on a national basis. And we try to make it most convenient for an individual so that they can be at the comfort of their own home and not stress, not have to go over to an office and feel like they're obligated to go and get set up, you know, with, uh, with a specific advisor. Um, what we want to do is just really see if we can help out an individual. And a lot of it comes down to making sure you have the correct plan, uh, not just, you know, not just having a portfolio. A portfolio is very easy. It's, 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 you know, very, very simple to just say, hey, I'm going to go take this account and just try to grow or take this account and just try to spit off income from it. But by actually having a plan and having a motion behind the plan and, and seeing that plan come to fruition, it's the, you know, it's the greatest feeling from an advisory standpoint. It's the greatest feeling. You know, from a, from a client standpoint, and uh, you know that that's what I try to do with these videos to help educate you guys. And this is why you know I called the channel Retire Sharp is to try to make an individual sharper throughout retirement and understand these these kind of complicated terms and just try to break it down to the most simplistic language. I want to thank you very much for watching this video. Feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel Retire Sharp so you can have access to the most updated videos. And also feel free to give our one eight hundred number a call and just reference this video one eight hundred five six six one zero zero two. We look forward to speaking with you. Thank you so much.